Okay. Uh, welcome to episode 13 of Talent Acquisition Trends and Strategy. I'm really excited about today. We are joined by Julia and Stephanie, our team leads at Secure Vision. Welcome. Thank you. We're happy to be here. Good stuff. Um, so, hey, before we, we jump into it, I know we, we have some really cool topics to, to talk about today. Um, could you both just uh, maybe provide like a short introduction, just talking about your background and experience and a little bit about what you do at Secure Vision? And uh, Julia, if you want to start first, you can jump into it. Awesome. Thanks, James. Um, yes. So I've been here at Secure Vision for about a year. Um, obviously, I've loved every second. And like James said, um, I got to move from the recruiter seat into the talent lead seat about five months ago. And moving into leadership has been really fun. Um, I really love getting, I still get to recruit, I'm still hands-on, but I also get to lead a couple team members here at Secure Vision and be part of just higher level kind of talent strategy planning of, for the whole company. So that's been really fun. Yeah, and you're crushing it. You're doing such a good job too. <laughs> Thanks, James. <laughs> Hey, um, I'm Stephanie. I have done kind of similarly. I started just about a year ago, moved up just about five months ago into the team lead role. Um, prior to that, I started my role in, in tech as an SDR and moved into an AE role and then moved into the recruiting side of all of that. So that's been really fun to have that background and speak to folks in rev roles and then here at Secure Vision, kind of open that up to all different types of roles. And then as Julia had said, move into the team lead role, focus a lot more on strategy processes, but also in that kind of player coach. So still getting to talk to candidates. Sure. Yeah. And that's, uh, and, and you're crushing it as well. And both of you are, are a huge part of, of why we've been able to, to grow and be so successful. So I'm really excited to, to have this conversation with you today. And if you all enjoy doing this, by the way, we can just do this maybe like once a month where we bring you on the show and you just share with everybody, like the things you're working on and what you're learning and what you're seeing out there in the market and, and whatever we want to talk about. Let's do it. The world needs to know what we see. <laughs> exactly. I, I agree. Uh, so, so, yeah. So I think, um, you know, one of the topics that I know um, you both are really passionate about and, and a lot of people are reaching out to you to, to learn more about is, you know, I, 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 we would love to get your thoughts on how how to become a top performing recruiter and how to 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 do the, the things you need to do in order to move up in your career and and um, ultimately, you know, move into a, a lead position and, and move into talent leadership. Um, and, uh, you know, Stephanie, if you want to start us off on this one, and then we can kind of just, uh, for each question, we'll kind of just alternate who goes first. We can just do it that way. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, I think in recruitment, there's a lot of moving pieces, obviously. Um, and so really making sure that you are focused on each aspect of it and knowing how to prioritize those things can be really important and help you to kind of move up and maintain what you have going on within your processes. Um, I come from a role previously where I was more focused on candidates. And I think that that's really helped to build the foundation of checking in with candidates, making sure that I'm calling them, um, making sure I'm checking in if they have an assignment, right? Like checking in periodically if it's due within a week, checking in on day two, day five, day seven, and really making sure that the candidate has everything that they need, especially in this market right now. Because if I'm not checking in on them, somebody else's, and then they're more kind of focused on that role. So maintaining that like being top of mind for candidates, I think has been really helpful. And then going back to kind of all your tasks is not only focusing on their late stage candidates, but you've got to go back and make sure that, you know, you're doing all of the things to make sure you get those. So just really blocking time on calendars and making sure that you have that focus all the way throughout and knowing that everything's almost equally as important. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with everything Steph said. And recruiting is a really unique blend of you have to be hyper organized, like she said, but you also need to be a people person. Like you have to genuinely care for your candidates and care for your clients and care for your team. And people can feel it. They can feel it if you're just acting the part so that you can get a promotion or close a role or make the client not mad at you. Like they can feel that. <laughs> they can feel your motivation. So I think cultivating that that genuine 
personal desire to see everyone in your circle succeed, to see your candidates succeed, your clients succeed, your team succeed. Um, and then as far as Steph and I getting to move up into this player coach role, it really came a lot from that, like our human first approach. And then both of us were already leading without the title. Like we already were stepping up in our client relationships. We already were mentoring younger members of our team. So just basically stepping into the role that you want, doing the things that are already your natural bent and that you're already strong in, or that you want to stretch in, just taking on those kind of opportunities and projects is going to go a long way in your career. Right. And I think, um, and I, you know, you all know how important like psychology is to me and how much I, I, I weigh that in the interview process when, even when I, when we, we brought both you on board and, and with everybody else as well. Um, I think it's, it's, it's understanding too. just, you know, if you want to move up, being willing to just proactively start to take on additional tasks and, and wanting to find solutions to problems and wanting to bring potential solutions to leadership and saying, Hey, like, I know we're doing it this way, but have we considered doing it this way? <laughs> right. Or have we considered implementing this change or, um, you know, and I think just some, sometimes, you know, people might, they might want to do that, but maybe they feel unsure about, is it really my place? Should I speak up? Should I say something? And so I think one of the the things to, um, you know, and it gets easier the more years of experience you have and, and, and just having a little bit more life experience too, I think helps too. But, uh, you know, it, it's really important that if, if you're not the type of person that feels comfortable to understand that if you don't feel comfortable bringing the, those things up, it's okay. And in fact, like, you know, if you're not comfortable, it means you're out of your comfort zone and it means you're doing something that's making you grow. And so one of the things that I talk about with people and they're moving up, um, if they feel like imposter syndrome or they feel uncomfortable about having certain conversations, I say, great, good. You know, like that, that means that you're growing, right? Like you're, you're putting yourself in a position where you're uncomfortable, where it's uncharted territory. You haven't done it before. That's how you know you're exactly where you should be. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Right. But, great job. Yeah. but two things there, one, it's great to have a leader like James who encourages that and like, will tell us and tells us to then tell our folks that we're leading those same things, you know, because sometimes you don't have somebody that will tell you, I know if you, you maybe have imposter syndrome or you're not feeling comfortable and that's okay. And that's a good thing, you know? So I think us being able to instill that in future folks that want to move into leadership and that trickling down from James, from Bridget really makes a world of a difference here at Secure Vision. Yeah, for sure. And I think it's, um, you know, I, I also think uh, one of the analogies I like to share with people too, uh, is I just, I, the weightlifting is just such an easy analogy because it's like, if you go, if you go to the gym in the morning, right. And if you, if you're lifting a, a set and you, it's not painful at all, it's not uncomfortable, then your, your muscle, you're, you're not growing. Right. Yeah. So I just, I can, I try to use that analogy with, with people. It's like, you know, when you're, when you want to move up and you want to, you need to be proactive and you need to be outspoken and you need to, to, to come to the table with ideas and show that you're engaged and that you want to contribute and help uh, and optimize the business. Um, it's it, again, it's, it's, it's okay to be uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, you, you know, you, 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 maybe we get to a point in our careers, I don't know, but we might get to a point where we want to be a little bit more comfortable, but, you know, <laughs> I think at least for most people and coming up in time, on acquisition, when you're, you're pushing to, to, to get that promotion, you, you also have to be willing to be uncomfortable and be willing to be in a position where it doesn't necessarily mean I'm, I'm not talking about like working crazy hours or anything like that. I just mean, right. in terms of the actions you take, the conversations you have, you have to be willing to put yourself out there and do things you haven't done before, which, you know, it might be, feel a little bit tough at first. And I think it's, it's honestly, I think that mental barrier that, that people quite honestly, you know, have, have trouble kind of overcoming uh, because, you know, different, you know, managers can be different personalities. Some can be more extroverted and introverted, but I think a common thread is people have to be willing to be out of their comfort zone and step up and try to find other ways to contribute and have maybe some, what might feel as like uncomfortable conversations where they're kind of putting themselves out there and being a little bit vulnerable uh, so that they can be, you know, thought of for, for a team lead or a leadership role. Mm -hmm. I agree. And one thing I'd add to that too is humility. Like I think the fact that both Steph and I, yes, we come with ideas, but we also come with questions. Like we're like, Hey, yeah. what do we think is a good way to solve this? What do we think is a good solution? Or when I'm struggling with my response rates for LinkedIn messages, I'll go to my team and be like, Hey, anyone have any good templates? Like we're not ever coming down and saying, Hey, you know, we're in a leadership position. So we're going to tell everyone how to do everything. We're still asking questions. We're still inquisitive. We're still humble. So I would say that's a huge piece. And like Steph said, you know, we see that from the leadership level here at Secure Vision, which is awesome. We see leadership asking questions. We see leadership 
leadership wanting to push in and, and hear from everyone about the best way to do something or the ideas that everyone brings to the table. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I, I have a follow-up question and um, Julia, if you could answer this one first, I, um, you know, one of the things Stephanie mentioned earlier was uh, in regards to, you know, checking in with candidates consistently and, and really investing in those relationships and that being a core part of being a, a top performing recruiter. Um, I'm, I'm curious to get both of your thoughts on automation tools like Calendly um, and different tools that actually kind of cut down on communication with candidates. Because obviously, like if you think about scheduling interviews, like that's a, it's, it can be a huge pain, particularly we've all worked with hiring managers that will reschedule like several times, right? <laughs> and, and so having that Calendly link that you can send out to new candidates and also candidates down funnel, um, it can it can feel like it's removing a, a big burden. But one thing that I found when I was, you know, an individual contributor is that a lot of the times when I was, um, you know, having those conversations with the candidates to schedule the interview, that's when I was doing what I call like ARPO, right? Like that's what I was kind of evaluating, you know, oh, hey, by the way, can you do Thursday at 12? Okay, great. Um, also, hey, how's it going? Like, where, where are you currently interviewing? Where are you in the process? Uh, how are you ranking the opportunities? Do you have any pending offers? Like, you know, I, I would have those conversations. Oh, what are you doing this weekend? Like, how's, how's your family? You know, I would have all of those conversations and ultimately build a much deeper relationship and also really understand how their mind works and like what they're prioritizing. So I'm just like, how do you strike that balance? Right? Because obviously we need to leverage technology mm -hmm. because it's, you know, it allows us to move faster and, and more, uh, you know, uh, hopefully more efficiently. But I feel like as a recruiter, there's, it's hard, right? Because how do you find that balance between automation and real genuine relationships? So how do you, how do you leverage tools like Calendly and how do you recommend uh, recruiters to leverage tools like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my recommendation is definitely, so we want, I run a three touch outreach process for my initial prospects when I reach out to them about a new job. So my first two touches, I do not include a calendar link. I just say, Hey, I'd love to chat with you. Let me know when works for you. And then I want to have that back and forth because embedding a link in those initial messages actually way drives down response rate. So when I feel more human, when I'm personalizing my template, I'm not just throwing links at my candidate, it makes it way likelier for them to respond to me. And then if by the third touch, they still haven't responded, um, then I actually find the calendar link can actually help because they're like, okay, fine, this is easy. I'll just click on this and maybe talk to her. But that being said, I agree that your first instinct definitely has to be maintaining the personal touch over the automation. Um, obviously, like Steph said, you have a million candidates in process at any given time. So you do need to be moving efficiently. but um, just that that initial touch i i'm really a big believer in making it as personalized as possible like i'll include um not only that ask of hey when works for you but i'll also include the name of their current company in my outreach so they know i'm not just blasting this out to 50 people so i think personalization is key not using automation especially for your couple first touches and then throughout your process like you said james not just blasting them with hiring manager Calendly links, even if that is how your hiring manager wants them to schedule, you can still ask questions like you said, you can still check in on their interview process, you can still make it a more personalized conversation the whole time. So that's what I'd recommend. I love it. Um, you know, it's funny, I was actually just talking about that with Bridget, who to clarify is my manager yesterday about Calendly, and she also doesn't send it out in the first touch. I've always sent it out, I include it in all of my touches, it's just at the bottom because then it's a choice, right? Like I'm writing a personalized message, of course, in my first touch, that's the most personalized, but it's also included there. That way, if the candidate so chooses, they can go ahead and schedule and I can avoid that back and forth. It's almost like uh, an option and it's way at the end. Mm -hmm. um, so I do include it. And I feel like those conversations I don't know if they really come up in scheduling and maybe it's because of the way I do things, but what I do is when I first get them on the phone screen, that's where I'm starting the real relationship. And I'm talking to them a little bit at the beginning of the call. How was your weekend? And, you know, making notes like, oh, they have a dog or, you know, so that I can check back in later on. And then towards the end of that phone screen, I'm also, so, hey, what's the best way to contact you? You know, like you can go ahead for me, you can text me on this phone number. Um, we can do email. We can also hop on a call at any time. I'm here throughout the process. So I will check in with you between calls. I'm also here to do scheduling. So, you know, if you feel like you're not getting your answers from the calls that you're on, or you'd rather speak with me than the hiring manager, and you have a certain question that we can always do that and just kind of really open that up. 
and get them their buy-in, right? Oh, you know what? Text is great for me. Or, hey, you know, I really don't check my phone during working hours. So email is the best way to get me. And then I will work on their kind of the way that they work with things and then pop in those kind of bits of how's your dog and all of that within those texts or emails or follow-up calls and things like that. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And, and I don't know about you all, but what I remember too, like when I was doing, uh, when I was doing IC work as a recruiter, like I would, I had this idea of like this upside down funnel where it was basically, so my candidate, the candidate funnel goes this way. Right. And at the bottom is final round interviews offers, but I would have like also this concept of like an upside down funnel where it's like the further down funnel somebody gets, the more time I'm actually spending with them. Mm -hmm. So it's like that, that concept of like, when I have somebody in what I would call stage four interviews or final round interviews, right. Um, from, I would, I would always kind of think like mentally about that kind of flipped funnel, mm -hmm. like the further down funnel somebody gets, the more time I'm going to spend with them, you know, scheduling or otherwise just on the phone, talking with them about other opportunities, what they're thinking about, what they're prioritizing, what they want to see in an offer, mm -hmm. you know, how they're going about the decision-making process. Is it a family decision? Are they, are they making it yeah. themselves? Like what, you know, all of those things, like the further down funnel they get, the more I'm, I'm, I'm investing time speaking with them. Mm -hmm. Agreed. I've never really thought about that in such a visual way, but I really like that explanation. But that's something that I tell to folks, um, whether they're on my team or sometimes when you're explaining to a hiring manager as well, right? Where, you know, we're going to start with like really getting... 50 candidates in for week one and making sure that we're fully calibrated. And then once we've got a good pipeline going, then we're probably going to ease up on outreach, you know, and that's because our time is flipped, right? We're more focused. It's not like we're less focused on this role, but rather we're spending more time with the candidates that are in later stages. So you're getting just as much time. And I try to explain that to my team in terms of if they're like looking at, oh, I've got a lot of roles going on and I can't possibly source for all of these all at the same time. But it's like, you can, you just have to kind of like flip the way that you think about your time. So I like your inverted funnel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, well, well, very cool. I, you know, I, I would love to, to, I mean, we have about 30 minutes left and I honestly, I feel like we could next time we do this, if, if you all want to do this again, we, maybe we can even uh, reserve a little bit more time um, just because I feel like there's so much we can cover, but um, I, I would love to also get your thoughts. Like you've worked with a ton of companies to help them hire at secure vision prior to secure vision. Um, the companies and the hiring managers that, that stand out, uh, that, that do an exceptional job. Are there any clear differentiators um, about how they go about or thinking about recruiting or how they execute um, that, that, you, that you could clearly say you know, to, to, to people out there, like this is, these are the things you need to do to be successful at recruiting, or these are what the, the best hiring managers or best companies are doing that's different than what the majority of the market's doing? Julia, would you want to start with that one? I do. Oh my gosh. I have two okay. clients that come to mind in particular um, that are strong in different ways. So one, kind of similar to what you were just talking about, Steph, in terms of you communicating to your clients, hey, as we get candidates down funnel, we as recruiters are spending more time with them. But I have this one client that they get that too. So not only do I pre-close my candidate after they've had their final interview, my hiring manager wants to pre-close them. So they have multiple touches with that person who's going to manage them. And so the client gets that personal touch piece. They're, they don't view recruitment as transactional. They don't view it as you just need to interview them and then move on. They're like, no, this is a person. They need to see who the team is, who their manager is going to be, what their life is going to be like here. So that's definitely a best practice. And then I have another client who... I love how quickly they're able to move. So again, it's not transactional. They're meeting, they're having these, you know, very in-depth interview conversations, but they move so fast. They don't waste the candidate's time. They respect that the candidate is making this choice just as much as they are. So from when I do my initial phone screen, they schedule one long panel interview. It's an hour and a half. And then they, they move to offer. That's it. They make sure everyone that needs to make the decision is on that panel. They move calendars, they make it happen, they prioritize it. And then I've had many instances where I screen a candidate one day, and then I've actually literally been able to offer by the end of the next day or at the very latest within a week. So that client is amazing at understanding the market and getting that they need to just move quickly and have that hiring velocity. And in order to move that fast too, they have to have a very clear understanding of what success looks like. <laughs> And, mm -hmm. and what the ideal profile looks like. And that I think just speaks to just a 
deep level understanding of the role requirements and the type of individual that's going to be successful at your company. Yeah, they're very dialed in and that client specifically. So they hire a lot of engineers. Mm -hmm. So that's almost an easier process because they have a lot of very technical questions where there truly are essentially yes or no answers, but they're also vetting for personality. Like they know the type of person who's successful there, which is why they do a panel and they have multiple people kind of experiencing them. Um, But yeah, they do a really good job of, of understanding the profile and then moving quickly on the right people. Cool. Yeah. Love it. Um, one of the things that I thought of is folks that are really strong criteria. So like you were saying, really know what they want and need for this role to be successful, both in soft skills and anything else that like is particular to their role, but are also open, right? So if they have these strong criteria, you can hit the ground running as a recruiter. If they give you like a certain list and they're like, this is what we need. But at the same time, if they find somebody that checks, you know, 80% of the boxes and maybe doesn't have that three to five years of experience, but rather has two, but they look great, then they're like, okay, or maybe they they don't have one particular um, item on their tech stack. And they're not going to just go ahead and ding a candidate because of that. I think those are super strong hiring managers and great folks for us to work with, right? Strong criteria, but also can tend to be open. Right. I think um, a lot of people too, they, I mean, it, this is common across any discipline, right? But people kind of simplify things that aren't in their own swim lane, right? Yeah. And, and also I think just, there's a lot of hiring managers out there that really don't have a good understanding of how what makes somebody successful uh, on their team. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, it's obviously we have to be as recruiters pretty tactful about, um, well, we don't ever really express that, but we, we try to dig to try to uncover like, okay, what are the top performers doing? What kind of background experience do they have? How are they wired? What are, you know, how, are, what's their day to day look like? Right. I mean, we try to, to get a pulse on that because usually when we see candidate or excuse me, companies uh, pass on candidates, for like missing this one minor thing, it's like, okay, do you, does the, my first question in my head is, does this hiring manager really know what is going to drive the best outcomes for their team? Mm-hmm. And uh, most of the times what I find is the hiring managers that will, will pass on something very small. They're not necessarily the best like strategic thinkers when it comes to thinking about business outcomes and business strategy. Like, mm-hmm. and, and that's where it's like, you have to, like, as a hiring manager, you have to be willing to like step back and you know, make sure you're not falling in the trap of oversimplifying something because you, you might feel like, oh, I've been hiring people for 10 years. Mm-hmm. You know, I know everything I need to know. And it, it's, it's just been my life experience as soon as people get to that place where it's, 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 they end up kind of dropping the ball sometimes. Right. So, um, yeah, I think the best companies, they're, they're focused on the business outcomes that the team needs to deliver. And, and then that's how they're kind of identifying, you know, what, what are the core fundamental skill sets and, 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 you know, that, that, that they need the person to have. And they're usually very flexible on, you know, some of the nice to haves, like they, they have clearly defined like the top three must haves. Right. Mm -hmm. And then they have a bunch of other things where they're nice to have, and you'll have some people that have, you know, one portion of the nice to haves, and hopefully you hire somebody in the future has a different, you know, different uh, attributes that are the nice to have group. Right. So you Mm -hmm. overall can have a pretty well-rounded team as long as they, fundamentally share maybe the three, you know, three common skill sets or something like that. Yeah, agreed. And I know that you posted about this on LinkedIn before James, but also hiring someone who can do at least 70% of the job mm-hmm. gives them ramp, like gives them room, gives them room to grow, makes it likelier that they'll stay. I think it's so important to not hire someone who can already do a hundred percent who will get mm-hmm. bored in six months. Yeah. I mean, like, think about it. Like, would either of you go into a role that you've done a hundred percent of, I mean, unless like somebody was like, okay, I'll pay you a million dollars. Like, and of course, <laughs> like you would, you would do it, but like, right. otherwise, like you're going to be like, no, like, why would I, I've, I've already done that. I'm looking for the next thing. So yeah. Yeah. it's, you know, and it's not just about money. Like, of course, like that's important, but like you want the money plus the growth, because if you have, if you get like a little bit of an increase without the growth, then ultimately that's going to stagnate in the future where exactly. you can't, you can't get more. So it's, like, I mean, I think that's how a lot of A players think, right? Like, for instance, I wouldn't want to take, if I wasn't growing, if I wasn't learning, uh, you know, if I, I just wouldn't be interested at this point in my career. Um, is that, is that how you both feel or do you, I mean, what are your thoughts on, on, on that? I mean, yeah, I think it's really important and love that you posted that and immediately liked it, that it is for folks to be able to grow. And like Julia said, then they're going to stay, 
You know, it, you could right. get, like you said, an increase in pay, but then you're not increasing your responsibilities. What is that going to mean six months from now, a year from now? Like, how are you going to grow? And whichever way you're thinking about it, if money is more important or a challenge is more important, you're going to get stagnant in one or the other if one of them kind of just stops. Yeah. I mean, all of the most successful people that I know are in positions that to like at least 20, 30% they haven't done. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of that though, James does also come down to you as a, as an individual, like seeking out opportunities like that. So I would say, even if your mm-hmm. job doesn't have baked in challenges that you haven't done before, I think you, you then need to go out and find them. If, if that's your, if that's your goal, if you want to yep. keep growing, if you want to keep challenging yourself. So I think it's both. Like, I know I personally took this job at Secure Vision because I saw, oh, awesome. Like just baked into the job itself are things I haven't done before. But then when I got here, obviously I also kind of checked out the landscape and I was like, oh, let me also choose some things and take initiative on some things that I could use to expand my experience as well. Right. So. And that and that's really cool that you mentioned that because that's kind of a full circle thing from our like the first topic we were talking about right. how to move up in your career, right? Exactly. <laughs> like, yeah. all connected. Like, like looking for things that you haven't done before um, and taking the initiative to, to make an impact, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's it's all super helpful. Um, I, I, I this is this is all really good stuff. So I know this is a ton of value for for recruiters uh, tuning in. So, um, I, I wanted to uh, also ask you just like what are the most common holes that you see hiring managers, uh, customers fall into? And I think we touched on some of this in terms of like oversimplification, but are you know from a process standpoint or or whatever else like do you see consistent things across the board that, that when companies are struggling to hire, it's like, okay, it's usually one of these three things, or is there anything at a high level like that, that you could speak to? Um, I think one of the things that stands out to me is when you have a team of hiring managers, not really choosing one person that can be the decision maker. And it's totally fine to have a team of hiring managers and have other folks that, you know, have ideas. That's great because when we do our check-ins on usually a weekly basis, to have more people on the call usually helps because you're getting the input of everyone and you're talking things through, right? That's the goal of the meeting. But if you are then trying to follow up and looking to get the candidate to the next stage, and everybody's kind of passing the buck on who's making that decision on whether they move forward or not, that can be a real hurdle. And so, you know, having a group of hiring managers, as long as you have that one decision maker, I think can be super beneficial. But if you've got too many people in there, you're, you don't have that like team captain, then that can be detrimental and kind of slow things down. And I've seen candidates be lost to other companies that are just moving faster. Mm. Yeah, I would say the biggest, pro- yeah, the biggest thing that's going to prevent you from making a hire is speed. That's been my experience yeah. is no, not being able to move a candidate quickly for the interview process. Um, and yeah, I mean, obviously there is, it, it, it's a huge decision for both for the candidate and for the company. So I'm not saying you should rush it, but I think being efficient, having a plan, knowing who needs to speak with them, knowing the feedback you need to get to this point, having a point person who makes the ultimate decision that's just going to allow you to move quickly and be confident in your decision either way. So yeah, I would say time and process is the biggest reason that a company would not be able to make a hire. You know, one thing that just never made sense to me, and I, I just, I just don't, I really have a hard time understanding is when you're working with a hiring manager that refuses to accept that their salary isn't in line with the skill set that they're looking for. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just, I don't, cause it's such a simple thing, right? It's not, it's, it's not very hard to understand that, right? Like, okay, we've interviewed 10 people, right? Mm -hmm. You're offering a hundred. The candidates are on average looking for 130. Like you're not paying enough in order to, to fill this role. Mm -hmm. Uh, unless it, it, but it's, it's interesting though, that that's still something where it happens. I think every recruiter has dealt with that, like a fair, a fair amount. I mean, not the majority of the time, but you know, I mean, it's something that's come up like several times over the years for me. Mm -hmm. And I could just, I can never understand why it's so hard for, for companies or or hiring managers to accept. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think what's hard right now is that the numbers are jumping up faster than like the stats support. So like if you mm-hmm. pull, if you pull the numbers on like salary.com or payscale.com or something, it looks like you said, like that role, this fake role should be at hundred K, mm-hmm. but the market has inflated so fast that the stats aren't showing that. So to your point, anecdotally, you can say I've had 10 candidates, all are asking for 130 to 150. But the hiring manager can say, well, no, the, look at what the, look at what the numbers say. And you're like, I hear you. I understand, <laughs> but this is what the people say. So right. it's that oh. balance too, of understanding where they're coming from. Like they're looking at their bottom line. Like they can't just be throwing money at people, but to your point, sometimes they need to, depending on the market conditions and the changes. Yeah. The other thing that always annoyed me too, is like when, uh, like leaders in startups and growth stage would use like a, like a what is it? Pay scale or what? The, yeah. the yeah. or whatever. And it's, that was like an aggregate of the entire U S market. That's not oh, yeah. in tech, right. but then they're looking at that and saying, Oh, this is what tech salaries are. It's like, no, no, the Bay Area. no te- like- tech is <laughs> yeah, tech industry. And then also, yeah, San Francisco, New York, like the core markets, I guess that's changing a little bit, but I mean, it's, it's like, you can't use a data tool that's pulling data from industries outside of tech. If you're in tech, mm-hmm. you need yeah. salary data from tech yeah they also it comes to a point also where a hiring team has been in the company for a really long time and so they think one they're looking at their like internal salaries right and you're not matching your current team salaries to what's going on in the market right now and they're like well you know we hired so and so three years ago and we're only paying him x and you're like yep (laughs) and now here we are three years later the market is very very different and they're trying to look at you know being comparable within their team which usually are trying to match that outside person that new candidate with the previous market obviously Uh, salaries. Whereas I think if you're thinking forward, then you're really thinking about maybe I need to raise the salaries for the folks that I have on my team to retain them and to bump that up so that the folks that I'm bringing in are, you know, more aligned with what we have Mm -hmm. internally and what's, what's going on in the market. And that can be a really hard pill to swallow for a CEO that's been in the same company for 10 years or for somebody that's like, this isn't their focus, right? Their recruiting is not their job. That's why we're here. But they, you know, really need to kind of think about it. And we have to be the influencers and the people that come with that data, not just from Payscale, but from <laughs> real folks that we're talking to every day and, you know, kind of bringing that all together to make it an easier pill to swallow. Right. Yeah. I remember I, I, I purchased, it was one of those pay something.com to, to pull salaries. And it was a, like an aggregate, you know, salary thing. Cause we were going to use that to put together salary guides within tech. And we, we paid for the service and then all of the data like was just terrible. Like it just was not applicable at all. And I was like, Oh my God, we just wasted. Like, it was, I mean, it was only a couple thousand bucks. I, uh, but yeah, it was still, I mean, obviously it's still like 2000 bucks for like, why do we spend this was, this is not, this is not helping. Have you been um, able to find a tool that does specifically focus in tech salaries or no? Yeah. So I think, um, and we don't actually, we don't pay for it right now, but LinkedIn talent insights probably would be recruiters best bets in tech because you can segment by market industry, uh, position and then pull like the average salaries and average tenures and, a fair amount of data. And it's, it's actually, I think it's, it's, it's um, the pricing is somewhat reasonable. I mean, it's expensive and it might be different for in-house recruiters than agency recruiters. Um, they, they, like a lot of LinkedIn's pricing is different for agencies than it is for in-house. Like it's more expensive um, for agency or more expensive for in-house? You, like LinkedIn recruiter licenses are more expensive for in-house huh. because agencies usually buy more of them. So they bring oh, so down they the a discount for a right. Interesting. Yeah. So the like in-house, I think LinkedIn recruiter licenses are around like 10,000 bucks a year. And um, for agency side, I think at the lowest tier, uh, it starts around like five grand or something. Oh, I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah. So, uh, but anyways, I, you know, we have a few minutes left here and some really practical insight that could help people, I think is um, like, if we can break, uh, break apart like tech recruiting. So engineering product design from revenue rules, like sales, uh, marketing, customer success, account management. Um, I would, I would just for growth startups and growth stage. Um, let's just say for tech recruiting, 
could you just give us a, an overview on, you know, where are the majority of your hires coming from? Is it, you know, are you seeing hires coming across from certain job boards or certain chan uh, other channels? Or are you seeing most of it from outbound sourcing or referrals or what is the, what is the biggest uh, placement source uh, for startups and growth stage that are hiring technical talent, whether it be engineering product design? And Julie, if you want to start with this one. Yeah, always outbound sourcing 100% of the time so, okay. yeah, for everything ever. So right. I do, um, I definitely find that, and I find that across like both tech and rev roles, but um, I think specifically with engineering, that's where the personalized approach is so important because almost every single engineer I talk to tells me I'm like the 10th message they got that day. Mm. And so you just have to differentiate yourself from the literal first interaction that you have with your candidates. Um, but yeah, that's going to be key. And I think they also like to know um, if your if your client is willing to share it, they like to know comp upfront. That's obviously important. Yeah. Um, and they like to know anything you can share about the, the tech stack, obviously without, again, I'm a big believer in not giving too much information in that first touch. So I don't include a link to the job description. I don't include my calendar, like I said, but I do just pick a couple pieces of the tech stack so they can just vet do I even want this job? Will this even fit with what I'm looking for? So I think right. that kind of information is important within. So, so the vast majority of hires that you're kicking across for, for technical engineering uh, product design is, is all coming from, from outbound sourcing on LinkedIn. 100%, 100%. You, okay. And do you have any clients or have you over the past couple of years had any clients that were effectively deleveraging off linked, LinkedIn outbound sourcing and leveraging other tools that were helping in a, in a meaningful way? Or have you pretty much seen like, really pretty much any other solution or tool kind of fail in, in comparison for tech recruiting? No, honestly, Dice is used really well by one of my clients. So they use that for app. On, it, it's, it's the same process. It's still app on sourcing, but they use that as another way to get good engineering candidates in their pipeline. What's um what, the, what percentage of hires comes from the Dice sourcing versus LinkedIn sourcing mm, for them? Still the minority, probably I would say maybe 10% come from Dice. Okay. Yeah. That's like just borderline, just enough for it to like matter, right? It's just enough for it to matter, right? right. So pay for one seat on Dice just to like keep it alive. <laughs> but obviously the focus is mostly on LinkedIn. So what does, in terms of time allocation, does that, is it, is it aligned where like 10% of your time is on Dice and 90% is on LinkedIn or? So for this client, they only have their internal recruiter source on Dice. Like we don't even okay. have Dice as, as Secure Vision. So okay. she, I, I'm not sure how she allocates her time, but she said the same thing where she finds a lot more success on LinkedIn. And just so the audience knows, this is around like a hundred percent growth stage, uh, customer, right? Yeah. Yeah. Their head counts around 120 right now. Yeah, okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. Just, just so people have context too. Yeah. Um, um, okay. And then on, on the, uh, revenue side, uh, Stephanie, if you can answer this one, sure. um, where are you, is it primarily outbound LinkedIn sourcing? Do you see any other tools making a significant impact right now? Where are most of the placements hires coming from right now for revenue roles? Yeah, for RevRolls, I think still, I think just the market that we're in, it's a lot of the outbound sourcing on LinkedIn. I do, however, have one client that gets a lot of inbound folks. And I think mm. it's just, I know, and I was surprised to find that out as well. Um, not for like BDR roles, but for like sales directors or like AE mm. roles. But I think they're in an exciting industry. Um, and also it's they, they're a fantastic company like they really just I think they have tons of great glass door reviews which you can always take with a grain of salt but usually if they're good then you're probably looking at like you can trust those versus like it being one angry employee that ruins the things you know um but yeah so as in terms of revenue rolls again usually outbounding but this one client they've got a lot of inbounds mm -hmm. So, so for that, for that one customer that has the inbounds, um, could you tell us a little bit, I mean, obviously from the candidate perspective, you know, what is a lot of those inbounds referrals, or is it really just that there's a ton of content generated, not only through Glassdoor, but on the company's website, the branding looks really clean and, and, and nice. I mean, what, like, what do you think is the differentiator there that allows them to get more inbounds than other companies that you work with? Yeah. You, know, you said industry piece though. I know you already said that piece though. Um, yeah. yeah, no, but you're right. It's true. Like they're, you know, it's because they're in the like social influencer space. 
And so okay. with that, their branding is amazing, right? And they're also exciting right now, just given that it's going to be a $16.4 billion industry by the end of 2022. So it's really booming at this time. It's relevant, you know? So I think it's a lot of that, but also they did do a fantastic job with branding. They have a ton of info about what it's like to work there on their page. Like, I think those kinds of things are super important. So it really spells it out. People aren't wondering. They're not just seeing a website that's built for clients or prospective clients. It's actually built for prospective candidates as well. And I think that that really helps. Okay. And are they, are they getting a lot of referrals as well? Or is it primarily just people that are independently finding them online? Some referrals, I would say, again, that's really maybe 10, 15% of what's coming through. Mm -hmm. But overall, it's really folks finding them and just applying. And their job posts end up on LinkedIn. And that you can see like where they come from in Greenhouse, for example. Mm -hmm. And they're coming from like folks applying through that job post that's on LinkedIn. But I think some of the things that get them excited to apply are on the website or in their job description and the job post that's there. And are the, are the job posts that this customer is using, are they sponsored or are they basically just posting them online and then LinkedIn is scraping them and putting them on the page? Yep. The latter. So they're okay. not, they're yeah. not even paying and, and still like that's generating inbounds. Yep. That's great. And what ATS are they using? Greenhouse. Greenhouse. Yeah. Cause I think, yeah. Okay. So, so LinkedIn, as far as I know, unless it's, it's like the limited postings, like the LinkedIn will scrape uh, from certain job boards from Google and basically push it to the company profile. It's not always consistent or sometimes it'll be missing some or something like that. But I think overall it's, it's usually a pretty good, uh, I, I don't think a lot of people realize that uh, if they post the position on, on, on greenhouse, like a lot of times LinkedIn will just scoop it up and put it on their page. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, really cool. So I think we're, we're coming up on, on time here. Uh, but this is, this has been a ton of fun. I think we, we covered a lot of good topics. Is there anything that either of you would like to discuss real quick or bring up before we, we jump off? Guys, I feel like we talked about everything. There yeah. was to I think, I think yeah. we've done it. Like we can, I think we solved it. I think we solved, we all solved it. <laughs> good job team. Nothing yeah. further. <laughs> yeah, this is super helpful. Um, I just think that. I mean, all of this and what we're going to do too with the episode is we will time stamp it. So people can like, let's say people are like, okay, what are, what are top recruiters doing in tech to for specifically for tech recruiting? Right. And they can go specifically to the later part of the episode. So mm-hmm. yeah, we covered, we covered a, a, a lot of important stuff. So um, yeah, this was a ton of fun. Would you, would you, did you guys have fun? Did you enjoy this? Yes. Oh, I love this. <laughs> yeah. I would do this anytime. Okay, cool. So like maybe we just put on a recurring uh episode where maybe like once a month we jump on and we just do this let's do it cool okay i'm here for it yeah did you have fun james oh yeah i had a great time this was this was good i i like uh it's it's nice this was you know we have a lot of really cool guests on 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 the show and and we've had um you know several uh, uh cpos and 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 really really senior level executives which is a lot of fun but a lot of the conversations that we we have are are focused on like transitioning to a remote culture and like all these types of things that are just very big picture. And so yeah. what's really fun about this conversation too, it's, it's, it's like, this is boots on the ground, moving up into, you know, talent leadership, how to get great outcomes for your clients, specific, you know, tactical things that people can implement, um, is, is really helpful. So yeah, this was a ton of fun. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. Um, well, very cool. And for everybody tuning in, thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time. Bye, everyone. Cool. We did it. Yay. 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 (laughs) All righty. I'll talk to you both soon. Thank Thank you. you. Bye. Bye.